cannot teach the titan law as given you are bringing back what is dead to life he takes away the first that he may establish the second the titan law is dead the bible says the dead shall be thrown into the lake of fire he killed malachi 3 that he may establish the second so if they take you to malachi 3 take them to revelation 22 that the dead shall be thrown into the lake of fire so the titan law has been killed it must not exist side by side the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus has set me what free from the law of sin and death join dr abel damino the senior pastor of power city international as he explores exegetically bible doctrine on tight and tithing date from sunday 14th of march to sunday 21st of march 2021 time monday 15th to saturday 20th 6 p.m daily sundays 8 a.m and 11 a.m gmt plus one join the broadcast on radio aquibum 90.5 fm uyo 11 a.m to 1 p.m xl fm 106.9 uyo 1 p.m to 3 p.m daily unuyo fm 100.7 3 p.m to 5 p.m comfort fm 95.1 uyo 6 p.m to 8 p.m inspiration fm 105.9 uyo 9 p.m to 10 p.m. and Heritage Radio 104.9 10 p.m. till midnight and also on Kingdom Live Network Station. Also live on Facebook at Abel Damino Public Figure, YouTube Abel Damino Ministries International, Twitter Abel Damino and Instagram at Abel Damino Watch Real Time. Host Doctors Abel and Rachel Damino. Don't miss out.
my salvation. Say, Jesus is my salvation. Jesus is my righteousness. Jesus is my righteousness. Deception collapses like a pack of cards before the truth of the gospel. Like Gozo Kola de Brina, Nengre de Zekele de Brina, Lagato Bengle de Bere, Rakoto Sukala de Brina, Agabaya Nakotoko, Egelina Managaga, Agarato Sekelida, Bebereke Tonokuda, Egelina Managogo, Egereto Sokoluda, Egelede Babarako Tongelia. In the name of Jesus, Heavenly Father, we come humbly. And we come respectfully before your holy written word. And we thank you for the privilege to feed from your word. Thank you for the mighty Holy Spirit that lives in our hearts to guide us into all the truth. We rejoice tonight that the entrance of your word giveth light. And it giveth understanding to the simple. So we decree that as your word comes forth with clarity, burdens and yokes are destroyed. Mindsets are corrected. In the name of Jesus, the wall of deception collapses like a pack of cards. 
around the world. In the name of Jesus, the truth of Christ grows mightily and fills up everywhere. We decree that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the water covers the sea. And we rejoice that tonight as your word comes with clarity, your people are edified, built up, equipped, and Jesus is glorified. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. Glory to God. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our faith together as we say these words. I am born of God. I am born of the word. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus' name, and every believer says a powerful amen. We want to welcome everybody connected to this service tonight by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, all of the social media community, our brothers, sisters, family, and friends on social media. What a joy to have all of you connected tonight. We're very excited because we're going to have an exciting time of studying the word of his grace. Our radio audience, we're so glad to welcome the entire Aquaibom State community to this great, wonderful service in this great week where we are looking at Bible truths on tithe and tighten all of you that are connected by way of comfort fm xl fm radio aquibom you know you fm inspiration fm heritage fm we want to welcome all of you to the service hey guys do me a favor call a friend a family member a loved one ask them to tune to this radio station right now life is flowing through the airwaves and our social media community what another opportunity to labor together in getting the gospel to the ends of the earth i'd like you to know that all of these labor you put in to help people get the truth of the gospel is a true reflection of the character of Christ to get the gospel to everyone out there who needs the truth of Christ. So do me the same favor you've always done. Share the video on your page. Share with as many people as you have on your page. All the groups on your page. Put the videos there. And of course, create watch parties. Drop them on monogram, telegram. Drop them on WhatsApp groups. Let's get the gospel to the ends of the earth. You know, Jesus is the desire of all nations. And all men seek Christ. So make him available to them on their social media handles around the world. All our house churches here in Aquaibom. What a joy to have all of you in the house church this evening everywhere. All over the state. We're so glad. And all our Bible study centers. I want to bless you and thank God for all of you. And our campuses around the world. We welcome everybody. And if you're just joining for the first time on this channel today. I'd like you to know it's going to be an exciting time. Just be patient and fasten your seat belts. We're going to have an exciting study of God's word. What a joy to have all of you here tonight. Grab your pen, your Bible, your notebook, fasten your seatbelt. Let's get on a gospel adventure into the word of his grace. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self tonight. <clears throat> Alright, so we're still looking at understanding Bible truth on tithe and tithing. We are exploring this subject and we're looking at the myths, we're looking at the explanation, we're looking at the practice, and we're also examining the malpractice. I believe we have had four services on this subject. And tonight we're beginning again from 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse number 15. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse number 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. For instruction in righteousness. We have said that the scriptures are not for mention. We have also said that the scriptures are for teaching. Whenever you see people pass error from generation to generation, they just mention scriptures, but the scriptures are not for mention. The scriptures must be explained. You must explain it in such a way that it brings clarity to the audience. It is the devil who quotes the Bible, just quotes the Bible without explanation. You don't just quote, you must explain. 
And quoting a lot of verses doesn't mean that you are teaching. Bra, 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 bra. It doesn't mean you're teaching. There was a man by the name of Apollos who could quote a lot of scriptures. He was a walking Bible. You know, you quote the Bible doesn't mean you understand what is there. It is when you explain it in the truth concerning Christ that you know what is there. We have been examining the subject of tithe. And I told you, I don't like talking about tithe. You know, Brother Paul never mentioned it, not even by chance. So you can imagine all the churches that Brother Paul pastored, he never taught them tithe. That means all the churches that Brother Paul pastored, nobody tithed because he never taught. He never talked about it. Not even a mention of it. The entire Colossian church, Ephesian church, Thessalonian church, Corinthian church, the church at Rome, none of them paid tithe because Brother Paul never mentioned it to any of those churches. So you can imagine a subject that the apostles, the early apostles, the foundational apostles, the apostles of the Lamb did not even have time to talk about is a major subject in the church world today. It shows you how far the church world is from the teachings of the New Testament. <clears throat> but I'm teaching it because I have so many questions on that subject. And we must understand the issue of sacrifices and offerings under the Old Testament. Many times we have brought the offerings of the Old Testament into the New Testament with the, without a full understanding of what it entails. So, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15, Brother Paul writes to Timothy, a protege of his. And he says to Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible talks about rightly dividing the word of truth. Where we have the word ototomio, O-R-T-H-O, T-O-M-E-O, -E Ototomio, which is to cut through stones, to be able to get something precious. To cut through stones in a bead to get something precious. And you have to be careful not to mix things together. Because if there's any danger, we must avoid a danger that is more dangerous than danger is when you have the law and grace mixed together. When you have the law and grace mixed together. And you know, we have that kind of adulterous doctrine all over the place. Because brother Paul says, the law is dead. And you are married to a new husband, which is the grace of God. So you can't be romancing your dead husband in the presence of your living husband. You can't be romancing the law, bringing the dead and the living to combine together. It makes a bad product. He says, if you go back to the law, you are committing adultery. Let's read it. Romans chapter 7 verse 1. Romans chapter 7 verse number 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. How that the law had dominion over a man. As long as he liveth. Verse 2. For the woman which had an husband is bound by the law to her husband. So long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Next verse. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man. She shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law. So that she is no adulteress. Though she be married to another man. Verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. That you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So you have some adulterous teachings today in the church world where people are committing spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. You are married to Christ. Christ has purchased you. You are born again, but you have gone back to be, to be romancing shadows and interfacing with the law. With the law. Tithing. 
You know, all of those Old Testament rituals that have been, have been over with because Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to those who believe. Where you combine the law of the spirit of life in Christ with the law of sin and death combination is very dangerous. And there are many churches that are involved in these practices. And it is key to note that. Now, Brother Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, verse number 2, Philippians chapter 3, verse number 2, Brother Paul says, Beware of dogs. It's not just a sign on the door of the house of a father who has ladies and doesn't want boys to come to the house. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concession. Beware of the concession. So he says, beware of dogs. The word beware means see, look, open your eyes. Make sure you see clearly. Who is brother Paul talking about? The word concession, beware of the concession is the word katatomi. Katatomi in the Greek. K-A-T-A-T-O-M-E. Katatomi. It means false circumcision. False circumcision. That word means to mutilate. Basically, to take off or cut off. To mutilate, to take off or cut off. Mutilation, katatomi. The thing about it is, is this. On the surface of it, it speaks of the removal of the foreskin. Physical circumcision. But brother Paul used it, you know, with a spiritual implication. Look at Galatians chapter 5 verse 12. Galatians chapter 5 verse number 12. I would that you were even cut off, which trouble you. That you were even cut off, which trouble you. The thing about circumcision he was talking about here in Philippians chapter 3 verse 2 is that they exclude people. So the Jews take off the first skin physically, but they exclude people. That is, they pick out things, then they exclude. They will tell you, you cannot be blessed if you don't do this. If you don't pay tight, it will be tight. If you don't pay tight, the virus will come. And this is supposed to be a New Testament church. You cannot be this if you don't do this. Four keys to. Five conditions for. Have you even had some preachers who preach five steps to salvation? It's part of the law. Five steps to salvation. Answer the altar call. Close your eyes. Repeat after me. Stay, you know, be holy. A man that is not born again. Be holy. Okay. Then number five, repent. Five steps. That's another gospel. There is no step to salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus. You and your household shall be saved. That's what it takes to be saved. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. You're saved. You don't need any step to be saved. But legalists will make it look difficult. In fact, legalism believes that you're not born again if you don't cry on the altar. You have to cry. Anyhow, just cry. Because for them, crying is salvation. So legalists have a pattern. Something that flows with their pattern. So in Philippians chapter 3 verse 3, the original Greek says the true circumcision. I don't know if our studio guys, do you guys have RSV? RSV. If you have the RSV, put up for me on the screen. Philippians chapter 3 verse 3. RSV. Because it has, it, it is written almost exactly the way the original is. Philippians 3.3. 3, R revised standard version. Very good. For we are the true circumcision. Observe the word true. We are the true circumcision who worship God in spirit. And glory in Christ Jesus. And put no confidence in the flesh. The true circumcision. The first one says false circumcision. The second one says true circumcision. Give me RSV again. Philippians chapter 3 verse 2. 
Philippians chapter 3 verse number 2. Look out for the dogs. Look, look out for the evil workers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Verse 3 now. Observe. Verse 3. For we are the true circumcision who worship God in spirit and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. All right now. So the first one is false circumcision. The second one says true circumcision. So he has two kinds of people. The true circumcision and the false circumcision. Observe, he didn't say we have the circumcision. He says we are. So the circumcision is a people. We are the true circumcision. Please pay attention. He didn't say we have circumcision. We are. So the false circumcision deals with physical circumcision. The false one. He says the true circumcision has nothing to do with the flesh. Jesus uses that word circumcision. John chapter 7 verse 21. King James Version. John chapter 7 verse 21. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work and you all marvel. 22. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man who gave the circumcision to them Moses Moses was following the tradition of the fathers look at verse 23 of John 7 where we are John 7 23 if a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision that the law of Moses should not be broken are you angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day. What Jesus is saying is, on the Sabbath day you take off the skin and it's work. Because to remove the first skin of a man is work. You're doing something. And on the Sabbath day, I am adding skin, which is also work. So you remove skin, which is work. I add skin, which is work. Which one is better? That's what Jesus was saying to them. You know, Jesus has his way of dealing with the Pharisees. You walk, I walk, and you're condemning me. Who should be condemning who? All right? That's what Jesus was saying to them. Now, some churches say women should not wear makeup and earrings. That it is not of God. But they paint their houses. They paint their houses. Is that not hypocrisy? You paint your house. You choose the color of your car. When you are buying a car, you say, I want red, I want blue, I want green. And that's the car you enter. And then you leave your body without. Hypocrisy. You know, some people are not pastors, even though they have a congregation. You didn't hear that. Some people are not pastors, even though they have a congregation. Because pastoring is a gift of grace. And you will find out when we appear at the judgment seat of Christ what I just said. Pastoring is a gift of grace. And if you are holding on to Moses, you are holding on to the law of Moses, you cannot be a pastor because the law of Moses has no grace. And pastoring is a work of grace. Some folks are business entrepreneurship coaches. They are not pastors. They are just coaches. Their job is they work on the pulpit and they keep coaching people on business, principle, business, ethics, year in, year out. And a believer cannot, much, cannot even grow on those principles. Now, so a pastor does not teach business. A pastor teaches businessmen. He does not teach business, but he teaches businessmen. All right? So circumcision... Jesus didn't say nice things about circumcision. And somebody said to me, how can you say a pastor should not teach business? Because the gospel has a kerugma. A kerugma. The Greek word for specific information. The gospel is not, generalized pro it's not a generalized profession. 
The gospel is not generalized information. The gospel is a kerugma, a specific information, a specific one. That's why brother Paul says, all the things I did as a Pharisee, I count them as dung for the excellency of Christ Jesus. And he said, when I came to you, I desired to know nothing among you save Christ, kerugma, specific information. The Bible, Romans 1, 16 calls the gospel, the gospel of Christ. Not the gospel of generalized information. Not the gospel of farming. Not the gospel of agriculture. Not the gospel of science. No, it is the gospel of Christ. It's a specific message. So, and if a man is not preaching that gospel all the time, he is not preaching the gospel. Because the gospel is the message of Christ. So circumcision, if you observe, Jesus never said anything nice about circumcision. Look at Acts chapter 7 verse number 8. Acts chapter 7 verse number 8. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. This was Stephen you know, preaching, I'm talking about circumcision. Look at Acts chapter 10 verse 45. Acts of the Apostles chapter 10 verse 45. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we see a people were called circumcision. They were believers. They believed the gospel, but they were also called the circumcision. Look at Acts chapter 11 verse 2. Acts chapter 11 verse number 2. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. So they were believers called circumcision. Now, the circumcision wasn't just a function of, of removing the first king. It was actually a belief system. Circumcision was a belief system or a belief system of the worship of God using natural things. A belief system of the worship of God using natural things. For example, you cannot pray without handkerchief. You cannot pray without a prayer shawl. You cannot pray without anointing oil. You cannot travel without dabbing oil on your head. You cannot do anything until a priest touch you with oil. You are in idol worship. It is a belief system of the worship of God with natural things. So there were a class of believers that were called the circumcision. In Acts 10 45 and Acts 11 verse number 2. Look at Romans chapter 2 verse 25. Brother Paul. Let's see brother Paul's commentary on the circumcision. For circumcision verily profited. If thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law. Thy circumcision is made on circumcision. 26. <laughs> so in other words. Circumcision is a function of the law. Okay, look at verse 26 now. Verse 26. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? That is the essence of it. It is to keep the law. Look at verse 27 and we're going to 29. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee. Who by the later and circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. And not in the later. Whose praise is not of men. But of God. So brother Paul says. True circumcision is in the spirit. 
That's why Paul will, you know, will call them false circumcision. So the circumcision they were doing in the Old Testament was false. The circumcision they were doing in the Old Testament under the law was false circumcision. All their sacrifices were false. All. All their sacrifices. Brother Paul lays another foundation in Romans chapter 4 verse 9. Romans chapter 4 verse number 9. <clears throat> Commit this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that that faith was, that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. He just told you that God did not impute sin on Abraham. Then he now says, look at that Romans chapter 4 verse 9 again. Look at what brother Paul says of, 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 of Abraham. Come at this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. That is, all Jews believe that Abraham was called righteous because of faith. All Jews believe it. Now, he now says in verse 10 of Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4 verse 10. <clears throat> Romans chapter 4 verse 10. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. That is, Abraham was called righteous before he was circumcised in the flesh. In other words, he was already circumcised before he was circumcised. He was already circumcised, the real one, before the false one. Look at verse 11 and 12 of Romans chapter 4. Please pay attention. Romans chapter 4. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness may, might be imputed unto them also. That righteousness might be imputed unto them also also so brother brother paul is saying abraham whom you call your father was not circumcised when he was called righteous so he says physical circumcision means nothing in other words he is saying all the physical efforts did, did that was done to satisfy god profited nothing before Abraham did anything in the flesh, he was already declared righteous. So he is calling whatever circumcision you do in the flesh irrelevant. Because Abraham was circumcised by faith before he was circumcised in the flesh. So he lays a good argument. Now look at Romans chapter 15 verse number 8. Romans chapter 15 verse number 8. Now... I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Verse 9, I love this scripture. Verse 9, <clears throat> and that the Gentiles might glorify God, might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles. And sing unto thy name. So circumcision can be viewed as a practice of the law. A system of belief of those who follow the law. And everything they are doing is not real. It's false. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 19. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Like I mentioned earlier, the circumcision there really doesn't refer to the removal of the foreskin. 
Because I doubt whether people know who is circumcised or not. When you look at people, you can't tell who is circumcised. You know, It's a practice that involves a system of belief where people begin to practice ceremonies. Where people begin to practice ceremonies. And they begin to practice the dictates of the law of Moses. For example, in Acts chapter 15, when the issue came up in the church at Jerusalem, and Peter was to put up an argument. Peter calls that circumcision a yoke. Why put ye a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? Look at Acts 15 verse 10. Acts chapter 15 verse 10. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? Which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. I don't think removing foreskin of a young boy is a yoke. So he can't be talking about removing the foreskin here. He is talking about that system of belief. That system of belief. The outward performance of worship. Clap your hand. Hit your leg on the ground and shake your head. Clap your hand. Hit your leg on the ground. What are you doing? What are you doing? You're clapping. You're shaking your head. You're hitting your leg on the ground. What does it mean? It is a belief system. The outward performance of worship. How you dress. You hear them say, you are now a Christian. You must realize that there are some hairstyles you don't do anymore. Hmm? You have to do sanctified hairstyle. Dr. Gabriel, you must show me which one is sanctified hairstyle. <laughs> Maybe punk. <laughs> Someone said, why are you making your hair? Are you a believer? Does this hairstyle glorify God? Why not leave your hair the way it is? Then you ask the person, why do you shave? Leave your hair to glorify God. You know, something about religion is that it always sounds stupid and unintelligent. Religion is always unintelligent and very stupid. When you listen to the argument, it goes nowhere. No basis. It's just, you know, just, it's just there. <laughs> it's just there, you know. <laughs> he said, oh, sister, God created you, but now you are putting lipstick. You are trying to tell God he didn't go do a good job. You are adding color to your lips. Are you sure you are still holy? And you, you are using cream on your body. You are rubbing cream. And you put perfume. So God did a bad job. He, he didn't give you natural perfume. So you are helping God to add perfume. God did a bad job. He didn't put cream on your skin. So that when you are batting. In fact God did a bad job. Why should you bat? You shouldn't shower. You should just be like that. Because God has finished the work. Religion is so unintelligent. I remember one church we went to back in the days. Just because I was wearing a jean, they drove me away from the church. They wouldn't let me come in because of a jean trouser. Just jean. Yet people were in the church with other materials. Religion is so unintelligent. Now, most of what religion does, or what we call the law, produces pretenders. Most of what we call religion or what religion does or what the Lord does is to produce pretenders. Pretenders. It breeds a lot of hypocrites. There are so many things in the hearts of these religious people they wish to do. And they are doing it in their heart. It's just that they have not found an opportunity to do it physically. Look at Galatians chapter 2 verse 7 to 12. Galatians chapter 2 verse 7 to 12. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, verse 8. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Verse 9, brother Paul, I love you, man. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, 
perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the hidden and they unto the circumcision. Verse 10. <clears throat> Only the world that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Next verse. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Next verse. For before that, certain came from James. He did it with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. That means in the church in those days, there were people that belonged to a clique called the circumcision. They are believers. But they belong to the circumcision system of belief. A system of belief that worships God in ceremonies. And we still have such people today. And oftentimes, what they try to do is, they know the Old Testament is over. So, they look for the significance of a practice of the Old Testament. They find ways to bring it back. Like someone was saying the other day, you know, Moses gave the law. And God said to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. You didn't get the joke. You know, Moses gave the law, but God said to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. That is, Moses who gave the law is dead. And even his body was not found. But some guys are looking for the body of Moses. Now look at Galatians chapter 5 verse 6. Galatians chapter 5 verse number 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but faith which worketh by love. So in Christ Jesus circumcision means nothing. Galatians 5 11. Galatians chapter 5 verse 11. And I brethren... If I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross seized. The offense, that is, he preaches circumcision. If that is what brother Paul was preaching, there will be no persecution. The reason for the persecution is that the gospel goes against that belief system that is indulging in ceremonial outward worship of God. That belief system. Bread, ribina, you know, uh, tasty time, bread, you know, anointing oil, you know, and all those things. A system of belief that indulges in the worship of God in outward articles, natural elements. I remember going to Kenya some years and one of the sisters who sat under my teaching, when Christ became revealed to her, she came with her husband to my hotel room and said, uh, Dr. Damina, you've liberated my life. I got tired of eating papa, apples, and oranges in church. Because our pastor said we should be bringing fruit to every service since we are looking for fruit of the womb. Then when it is time for prayer for the fruit of the womb, you start munching the fruit so that you can be fruitful. She said, I got tired of it. And I knew there was something empty in that practice. He said, now that I have seen Christ in your teaching, the emptiness of that practice is exposed. How can you combine the power of God with fruits? Oranges, guava service, pineapple service, popo service. I don't know where they get the scriptures to back that with. And some of you hear them talk about the covenant of salt. So they give everybody salt in the service. Where did they get that from? Maybe they didn't read where Jesus said, you are the salt. You are the light. You are the salt. Don't go to the kitchen to carry salt. You are the salt. Salt cannot be eating salt. I don't know how they read their Bibles. You know, religion just makes people stupid. And they, it makes people unintelligent. It makes people not to think, not to reason. Meanwhile, God says, come, let us reason together. Let us reason together. So, you know, the law, the law is full of ceremonies. 
And the reason why people are against the gospel of Christ is because it has no laws. It doesn't have burdens. My yoke is easy. Stand in the liberty. Wherewith Christ has set you free. And somebody say, are you just saying just like that? You mean just like that? Be careful, oh. Be careful of those people who preach sugar-coated messages. They say God is love. Then they will tell you, I know that God is love, but what about the other side of God? The other side. There is a love side and there is a judgment side. Oh, I agree with you, brother. There is a love side and there is a judgment side. But what you don't know is that the judgment side has been taken by Jesus on behalf of man. The Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the earth, he has taken it away. Once you believe in him, there is no more judgment. Glory to God. No crema, no catacrema, no crisis. No condemnation, no guilt, no judgment, no sentence. Glory to God. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are aware in Christ. In Christ. The truth of the matter is, most of these pastors, they know that when the grace and person of Jesus is preached, it will take away the control from them. And they want to control you so they don't want the truth of the gospel to be preached so that they can take advantage of your ignorance and manipulate you. you know, it, it takes away control. That's why they resist the message. You see how Elijah and Moses were heroes. How they worshipped them. Moses held them spellbound for years. Then after holding them spellbound for years, one day said to them, A prophet like unto me shall the Lord your God raise of your brethren. Him shall you hear. After he has tormented them. He now said, look, look, don't look at me again. Don't mind me. He's coming. The real deal is coming. Him shall you hear. All right. After dealing with them his way, he now said, hear that one. So the law and the preachers of it or those who preach mixture, law and grace. They don't like the truth of Christ to be preached because it takes away the control. The second thing the truth of the gospel does is it takes the attention from the man and puts it on Christ. And a lot of pastors have enjoyed hero worship. They've enjoyed stardom, stardom, the only man of God. And then now when you want to take that away from them and let Christ and Christ alone be seen, they will fight it with everything they have. But too late. The gospel is growing. The influence of God's word is filling the nations. Men and women are coming to the knowledge of the truth from every walk of life. And it's too late to stop this gospel. And so mightily grew the word and prevailed. Somebody shout hallelujah. Galatians chapter five, 6 verse 15. Galatians chapter 6 verse 15. <clears throat> For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Look at Galatians chapter 6 verse 16. Galatians chapter 6 verse 16. And as many as walk according to this rule, Peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. Colossians chapter 2 verse 11. <clears throat> and in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Colossians 3 11. Colossians chapter 3 verse 11. Where, where there is neither Greek nor Jew. Circumcision nor uncircumcision. Barbarian, Scythian, born nor free. But Christ is all and in all. Colossians 4 11. 2 11, 3 11, 4 11. Colossians 4 11. And Jesus, which is called Justus. Who are of the circumcision. These only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Titus chapter 1, verse 10. Look at the way Brother Paul warns against this legalist. For there are many unruly and vain talkers 
and deceivers, especially day of the circumcision. Especially day of the circumcision are unruly, they are vain talkers, and they are deceivers. Especially day of the circumcision. He calls them vain talkers. He calls them unruly. Then the third word, deceivers. Why does he call them deceivers? Because they are hypocrites. They are not true. The law produces hypocrites. He calls them deceivers. Look at that Titus chapter 1 verse 11. Titus chapter 1 verse 11. Whose mouth must be stopped. Who subvert whole houses. Teaching things which they ought not. For filthy look your sake. Filthy look your means money. Whose mouth must be stopped. This is a key fact of the Jews. It, this is critical where the Jews are concerned. The funny thing is Jesus was circumcised. Why? Because he was born under the law. In Luke chapter 2 verse 21, Jesus was circumcised. And John the Baptist also was circumcised. In Luke chapter 1 verse 59, because they were under the law. You know, the Bible lets you know that Jesus was born under the law in Galatians 4 4. Galatians 4 4. Now, so when people say, well, Jesus ate the Passover. He was under the law. He was not of the law, but he was under the law. Under the law. He was circumcised, but the circumcision means nothing. And the fact that Jesus ate Passover doesn't mean you two should eat Passover. So a teacher of the word must teach true circumcision. We are the true circumcision that worship God in the spirit. The true circumcision is of the heart. That is, you must take people's attention as a teacher of the word away from physical things. Away, far away from using ceremonial objects and physical things as objects of worship. You must take people's attention away. That is the job of a teacher and preacher of the word. That is... You must take people's attention away from physical things. Outward performance to become. Teaching them what God has done for them in Christ. Not what God will do. That's another gospel. The gospel is what God has done. Because the work has been finished. In John chapter 4, Jesus has a discussion with this woman. And it was about mountains. <laughs> mountains. Dr. Gabriel, mountains. People that like to go to mountains. From one mountain to another. Jesus had a discussion in John chapter 4 verse 23. You know, some music minister told me, true worship is when you are crying. When the song hits you and you use your tears to wipe Jesus' feet. You cry. Even if you're singing nonsense. That's deception. That's deception. I was disappointed that he could say such a thing. I thought he knew better. I was disappointed that he didn't know as much as I thought. I was disappointed that I was rating him too high. Whenever you see the word true, true, for example, John 1, 9, true light that lighted every man. Luke 16, 11, true riches. All right? Whenever you see the word true, it means the opposite of something. In the natural or the opposite of something symbolic that means before now worship was symbolic because worship before now was in the natural but what jesus is saying from now worship will be spiritual that's why jesus says true worshipers worship in spirit and in truth not in symbols and ceremonies that means before now, worship was made with things. They had vessels of ministry. They had temple in Jerusalem. Jesus said, you won't have to go to any temple. You won't have to use vessels anymore. You won't have to use oil, handkerchief, and all of that. All this kind of stuff. He now says, worship is in the spirit. He uses true worship. A worship that has nothing to do with things. 
This worship of God will now be done in Christ. It wouldn't have physical sacrifices anymore. Hebrews 10.1. Look at it. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1. I'm really enjoying this. Hebrews 10.1. For the law has in a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never. With those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the commas thereon to perfect. He says it can never make the commas perfect. In verse 2 of Hebrews 10, pay attention. Hebrews 10 verse 2. For then, will they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. Then Hebrews chapter 9 verse 9 to 10. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 9 to 10. Which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience. Verse 10. Which stood only in meats and drinks, outward ceremonies, and diverse washings, and carnal ordinances, imposed on them until the reformation. Verse 14 now. Oh, glory to God. Verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Can everybody say with me very loud, my conscience has been purged to serve the living God. Glory to God. So things you give or didn't give has nothing to do with worship like the Old Testament. Things you give or didn't give has nothing to do with worship like the Old Testament. So we began to look at the tithes. I know a lot of people have been like, uh -uh, go to the tithes, we've been waiting for the tithes. Well, in Bible teaching, we lay foundations to explain Bible truths so that we have sound exegesis. So we began to look at the tithes and we said there are three types of tithes in the Old Testament. Number one, the Lord's tithe. Number two, the festival tithe. Number three, the tithe for the poor. And we say the total calculation of tithe under the law was 23.3%. So let's go into more. One of the reasons why I am doing this is not because in power city, it's not because you don't believe that tithe is not one of the prescriptions of the New Testament. I know you believe that. You know, after all, over 10 years now, nobody has asked for tithe in this church. Nobody has spoken tithe in this church for over 10 years now. You know, we, 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 it's not an issue anymore. But it's so that you can teach others. You can sit others down and free them from bondage. You know what the tithe does? Because it is the law. It puts condemnation. It binds people. It makes people guilty. Especially if by any mistake, they had a problem that could kill and they use the tithe to solve it they come under guilt they lack boldness they, they they lose confidence they are not sure god is going to hear them again and because the pastors taught them that if you touch your tithe it will be tight once they touch it in their mind they create a room for satan to make things tight because they are expecting it to be tight and their expectation cannot be cut off so that ministry is the ministry of condemnation is the ministry of condemnation. They tell them, if you don't pay your tithe, you will have an accident. So once something, and a man cannot be under such pressure and say, no, I am going to let my child die because I must pay my tithe. He, 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 many people can't do that. You see your child die, you have 10% of your money only remaining, you are planning to give to the church on Sunday, and your child is dying. Of course, and the doctor says, if you don't pay, they will not treat the child. You pay and treat your child. And then once you do that, you come under guilt and condemnation. And before you know it, you have an accident. Then the pastor said, didn't I tell you? But he is the one that put you under guilt by his teaching. He has bewitched you. He has put you under a spell. So now you're expecting. How be it? There is not in every man this knowledge. For with the knowledge of an idol, they eat it as a thin offer to idol. And their weak conscience is defiled. See that? 
So that is why that ministry is the ministry of condemnation, which brings the ministry of death. So that's why the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death and condemnation. That's why we don't teach tithing. We don't teach it. Because it's not the New Testament. And we don't get people to practice it. And even when we teach it, we are teaching it so that it can help explain to people and free people from that guilt, condemnation and bondage. Are you still in the building? So the essence is to ground you to where you too can get others grounded. You know, I tell pastors, if you teach people their reality in Christ and you show people their nature, the love of God has been shed abroad in the heart of believers. Just show them who they are. Generosity comes alive. People will give more money than tithe. People will give without any control. They will give and give with joy to support a righteous cause. Let them that favor his righteous cause shout for joy. Let them continually say, the Lord be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of his house. No pastor can be more faithful than the Holy Ghost. No pastor. Teach the people the truth. Leave them with the Holy Ghost. He will perfect his work. You can't be more faithful. That's why many of you pastors, your members deceive you by paying what they call tight, which is really not tight. They just do it so that you will not be looking at them somehow. But in their heart, they know that they're not being honest to you. A pastor told me with all the tight teaching, they are not still paying. I say because eh, eh, that's not the gospel. The Holy Ghost is here to glorify the finished work of Christ. All right, now, so let's quickly look at some things. Over the years, I've been a Christian and having been a pastor for a few days now, I know that people are very smart. Having been around to see all the styles of tithe, some guys will tell you, Abel gave tithe. That's a bad way to start lying from Genesis. A very bad way. You know, the devil is a liar. He lied from the beginning. <clears throat> Seller. Genesis 4, 3 to 4. <laughs> Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 to 4. <clears throat> and in process of time, it came to pass that came brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Verse 4. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. The New Testament in no way has ever called that tithe. In no way. Imagine someone calling the tree of the knowledge of good and evil tight. That's wickedness. Hebrews chapter 4, 11 verse 4 calls what Abel did a sacrifice. But if you want us to do this, then let's burn the money. Because what Abel did was a sacrifice. So if you want us to do it like Abel, when the people, when we bring the tithe, let us together burn it. So that it is a sacrifice. See that? If you want to follow it literal, <laughs> let's burn the money. The second person that holds people more is Abraham. Genesis 14. Now, if you're going to apply Abraham, because they keep saying, tithe was before the law. Tithe was before the law. Ask them, what kind of tithe was before the law? That's a very good question to ask. What kind? Because there are two kinds. There's tithe before the law. There's tithe under the law. Tied before the law was tied from spoils of war. And there's no war. We've not gone to war to be able to bring spoils. So since we have not gone to war to bring spoils, then there is no tide of the spoils of war. Because in Genesis 14, the background is Abraham took 318 trained servants in his house to war, to rescue those taking bondage. So he got there, and brought the spoils of war. And as he came back, he brought all the goods. Look at Genesis 14, 16. Genesis chapter 14, verse 16. <clears throat> and he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. So whatever he brought back was not his. Whatever Abraham brought back from war was not his. What he brought back were spoils of war. Look at verse 17 of Genesis 14. 
And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedeloma and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shaveh, which is the king's dale. Next verse. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the most high God. So whatever Abraham brought was not his. Then we have Melchizedek between who came as a priest of the most high God. Now look at verse 19 and 20. Verse 19 and 20. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the most high God, possessor of the heaven and earth. 20. And blessed be the most high God, which had delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. He gave him tithes of all. So whatever he gave to him was in sacrifice. He gave him a tithe of all. Look at verse 21 and see what happened with the king of Sodom. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me thy persons and take the goods to thyself. So Abraham was not interested in the spoils of war. Look at 22 and 23. Pay attention. Verse 22 and 23. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. 23. Pay attention to 23. That I will not take from a tread even to a shoe latchet and that I will not take anything that is thine. So the spoils of war were not Abraham's property. Lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. So Abraham said, I will not touch or take anything. So eventually, Abraham gave everything. 10% to Melchizedek, 90% to the king of Sodom. Alright? Now, we studied that the 90% he gave to the king of Sodom belonged to the Sodomites. Notice that that part of the spoils of war were the people. And all the people were returned to the king. There's one more detail. But before he gave the spoil, he actually took out of it. But what did he do? Look at verse 24. One more detail there. 24. Save only that which the young men have eaten. And the portion of the men which went with me, Anna, Eskol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. But before he gave the spoil, he actually took out of it. And he fed his army. He took out of it and gave his army to eat. Okay? Now, do not also forget that in those days, slavery was a practice. People were taken as possession. I mean, human beings. Was Abraham giving out of his own salary or the spoils of war? Spoils of war. So that means the genesis of titan is titan from spoils of war. I read some historical documents that showed it was a practice that predated Abraham. Spoils of war was given to deities to honor them. When you go to war and come back, you take 10% of the spoils and honor the king. Notice, it's not something that God asks him to do. And again, he never repeated it, not even once. What he gave to Melchizedek, did he include human beings to Melchizedek? No, there were no human beings. Obviously, all the persons were restored to the king. Then out of the goods, he takes part out of it and gives to the servants. Then he takes 10% of what was left. He gave it to Melchizedek and returned the balance to the king of Sodom. So spoils of war. And it's ridiculous for anybody to want to repeat this act. You will see that this practice was repeated again in Numbers 31. But differently. Under the law. The tithe of the law is not the same system as the tithe of Abraham. The tithe of Abraham was 10% of the spoils of war. The tithe under the law was 23.3% of livestock, agricultural products, and kitchen spices. Curry, cumin, anise. I don't think what Melchizedek collected were fruits. 
because it was spoils of war. One of the malpractices is trying to practice what cannot be practiced. Look at Numbers 31 verse 7. <clears throat> Numbers 31 verse 7. And they warred against the Midianites as the Lord commanded Moses. And they slew all the males. Verse 16. 16. Numbers 31 16. Behold, this caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Give me verse 15. 15. <clears throat> verse 15. And Moses said unto them, Have you saved all the women alive? Verse 17 to 19. Please pay attention. Numbers 31. Now therefore, kill every male among the little ones. And kill every woman that had known had known man by lying with him. 18. But all the women, children, that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. 19. And do ye abide without the camp seven days. Whosoever had killed any person, and whosoever has touched any slain, purify both yourselves and your captives on the third day, and on the seventh day. So he is talking about the spoils of war tithe. This is very similar to what Abraham did. But see the difference. Verse 25. Numbers 31. 25 to 29. <clears throat> and the Lord spake unto Moses saying. Next verse. Next verse quickly. Take the sum of the prey that was taken. Both of man and of beast. Thou and Eliza the priest. And the chief fathers of the congregation. And divide the prey into two parts. Between them that took the war upon them. Who went out to battle and between all the congregation. Pay attention now. And leave, lay thee a tribute unto the Lord of the men of war which went out to battle. One soul of five hundred, both of the persons and of the beeves and of the asses and of the sheep. Take it of their half and give it unto Eleazar the priest for an heave offering of the Lord. Thirty. And one of the children of Israel's half, thou shalt take one portion of fifty of the persons, of the beeves, of the asses, and of the flocks, and of all manner of beasts, and give them unto the Levites, which keep the charge of the tabernacle of the Lord. This is a spoil of war tithe. It is very different from what Abraham did, because this one was 20%, not 10 Abraham's son was 10%. The one in numbers was 30%. I mean 20%. So you don't repeat tithe of the spoils of war. It's not practical, practicable. He is not dealing with, you know, salaries. He is dealing with spoils of war. In numbers, they took 20%. What did Abraham give? 10% of the goods. No men were involved. In numbers, men were involved. The other person who paid tithe or gave tithe is, is a levy. And that was Jacob. Genesis 28. And Jacob was a scammer. Go and find out whether Jacob fulfilled it or not. What about Joseph? Joseph, who should have learned tithe, goes into Egypt. Where he rescued the land by virtue of working for Pharaoh. And he made some decrees. What decrees did Joseph make? Genesis 47, 13 to 20. 20. 13 to 20. Glory to God. Genesis 47, verse 13 to 20. And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. Give me verse 18. 18 because of time. Verse 18. Genesis 47. When that year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord how that our money is spent. And my Lord also had our herbs, herds of cattle. There is not aught left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land, buy us and our land for bread. 
and we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh and give us seed that we may live and not die that the land be not desolate. 20. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For the Egyptians sold every man his field because the famine prevailed over them. So the land became Pharaoh's. Joseph, very smart, shrewd businessman. Look at verse 24 of that same Genesis 47. Still reading the same story. And it shall come to pass in the increase that you shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh. And four parts shall be your own. For seed of the field and for your food. And for them of your households. And for food for your little ones. So what was the tax that Joseph commanded Egyptians to pay? 20%. And they were to pay it to Pharaoh. Joseph didn't do that uh, tightening thing. He just did business. And don't forget the priest he's talking about. Remember, Pharaoh was a god. Pharaoh was an idol. So the priests were idol worshippers, not Levi. So you can see that the practice of taking a percentage to a priest was an idol practice. It was a practice of those days. It has nothing to do with whether it's God or not. It's very important to note. You can't sustain tithe in the book of Genesis. Now, in Leviticus 25, we pointed that the tithe is to be paid in the seventh, I mean, the tithe is to be paid, but in the seventh year, no tithe. How many churches practice that? That a whole year, the church will tell the members, since we have been in existence, this is seven year of our church, throughout this year, don't pay tithe. Just enjoy God. But Titan had a year where nobody paid tithe, which was the seventh year. In Leviticus 25, verse 1 to 7, you can read that at home. The tithe that was meant for the Levites, and notice, notice everybody, notice. The tithes that were meant for the Levites, who were priests, was because they were serving in the house. Do you know that the Levites only ministered in the temple three times a year? The Levites only ministered in the temple three times a year for one week. So tithe was only paid three times a year. Because the Levites only ministered three times a year. Which means tithe, even under the law, was only paid three times a year. Not every month. Exodus 23, 14 to 17. Exodus 23, 14 to 17. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Thou shalt keep the feast of unliving bread. Thou shalt eat unliving bread seven days I have commanded thee. In the time appointed of the month Abib, for in it thou camest out from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty three times. Verse 17. Three times in the year, all thy males shall appear before the Lord God. So tithe was paid only three times a year, and the tithe was food stock. Three times a year. You can read Leviticus 23, 1 to the end. It has all those details too. And Deuteronomy 16, 16. So the practice was three times a year for one week. Three times a year for one week. And today we have no Levites. So when a pastor say pay tight, tell him please sir, where are the Levites? Because you are the priest. You are the priest. So we want to pay the tithe to the Levites. Who are the Levites? Then it is the Levites that interfaces with the priest. And there are no Levites today. Even Jewish people will laugh at you. <laughs> Dr. Gabriel. Because in the land of Israel today, Nobody pays tithe in all of Israel. Where this Levite thing started, all of Israel, nobody pays tithe. They have an understanding of what a tithe is. So nobody does. Because at AD 70, historically, the temple was destroyed. And the records of genealogy have been destroyed. So nobody claims Levitical descendancy anymore in Israel. Not even in Israel. 
But Nigerians today have become Levites. We have a lot of Levites in Nigeria. How do you become a Levite for God's sake? When Christ's priesthood is not natural. It's not natural genealogy. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 16 and 17. Hebrews 7, 16 and 17 as a roundup. Are you blessed tonight? Who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testified, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Look at verse 13 and 14, Hebrews 7. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. It is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Give me verse 11 and 12. Kabayada, pay attention. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Levi is gone. Titan is dead. Levi is gone. Titan is dead. Remember, Jesus' priesthood was after his resurrection, which we are called the new birth. So he could never have called him a priest in the natural. He can only be a priest supernaturally in the sense of spiritual. He is a priest spiritually by the virtue of his resurrection. And we are in his resurrection. He brings the Jew and the Gentile into one body. So his priesthood is not found in the law at all. Let me add this. Did you notice that brother Paul never used the word priest? Not even once. So we can say that the language of high priest is symbolic. Because when the writer of Hebrews calls Jesus the high priest, and by reference John in his vision, Peter doesn't call Jesus high priest. He calls us priests. And Paul doesn't use that word at all. Because Paul's audience were largely non-Jews. So the term priest has no communication to them. Because there's no way you could talk to someone about priesthood who doesn't know about temples. So to talk about tithe in Nigeria is not just bad, but a malpractice. Stop tithing. When you see someone asking for tight, tell him, stop being a pseudo-Levite. Stop being a pseudo-Levite. You are not a Levite. Do you know that Jesus never called himself high priest? He never. Some people say, whenever you pay the tight, Jesus collects it. <laughs> but it goes into the account in Nigeria. And some people say, you give the tithes to the representative of Jesus. The fivefold ministry. And when you pay the tithe to the fivefold, they take it to Jesus figuratively. And then they bless you literally. They present it figuratively. And they bless you literally. <laughs> there are those ignorant of the truth. There are some pastors, they are doing it ignorantly. And they are, they are not manipulators. They are just ignorant. But some are deceitful. You know? But even if you're ignorant, when you hear clear exegesis like this, and you continue, it means you are false. It means you are not genuine. If you're paying tight, you are placing yourself under the curse of the law because nobody asks you to do it. Under the curse of the law. And Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Be made a curse for us, for it is written, curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, that we may receive the promised spirit through faith. Tomorrow we're going to dismantle Malachi 3 completely. We're going to deal with, you have robbed me, 
We are going to deal with your cause with a cause. We are going to deal with all of those terms in Malachi. So tomorrow, we are dedicating it to finish Malachi and close Malachi down so we can continue with Ephesians and Colossians. Glory to God. Glory! Somebody bless. Get on your feet. Shout glory! Amen! Woo! Lift your right hands to heaven, Father. We rejoice that we have the privilege of learning, being equipped and growing and enjoying the liberty that is only found in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the privilege to teach your word. Thank you for the glorious light of the gospel shining in the hearts of your people. Thank you that every dark cloud and every mindset that is contrary to what Christ has done is, is giving way to the truth. Thank you that deception and falsehood is collapsing globally like a pack of cards. Thank you that an army of men and women that will preach the truth of the gospel are rising in every man's world. And Father, we rejoice and we decree that the word of God is growing mightily in the nations. Lord, I pray for pastors and men of God who are struggling with these realities. That by the revelation of the Holy Ghost and the witness of the Holy Ghost, you will bring them to a place of conviction and persuasion. So that God's people will be liberated all over the world. I thank you for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. Listen, I got a mail today. I like to read so you hear. I, I love the sincerity of the person. That's why I want to read it. He said, hello, Dr. Damina. I am Joseph from Malawi. I was watching a video clip of your teaching about tithe. Honestly, I'm impressed with the teaching and I'm taught. What I want from you now is to teach me the right way of giving. For I have been giving money for tithe, for offering, for mercy, and for pledges. Your response will be my pleasure. It touched me. He's not arguing because he has seen the truth. But now what he's asking is, teach me how to give right. And we shall do that because we are still on till Sunday. So brother Joseph, stay with me. You will soon get the, the whole truth. A lot of pastors say, okay, you have, you have taken away the tithe. How do church get funded? How was brother Paul funded? How was Jesus funded? None of them took tithe. None of them asked for tithe, yet they did ministry extensively. How did Peter, how was Peter funded? How was James? How was John? How was Timothy funded? How was Titus funded? These are our pastors, yet you won't find tithe in their epistles. There's a more excellent way. Glory to God. There's a more excellent way. Yeah, and we shall find out that more excellent way. Somebody shout hallelujah. All right, grab an offering, everybody. We want to give in faith. We want to give with joy so we can get this good word going to all the nations of the earth. And I want to thank partners and friends who keep giving to support this ministry, who keep honoring this ministry. And because you honor this ministry, honor, you just keep enjoying honor yourself, you know, as you keep honoring this ministry. Because when you honor a ministry, you, you receive from the blessing and the grace of God upon that ministry. And thank you for the honor of partnering with us to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. You don't want to go away because I'll be joining Mr. Michael Bush in the other studio in the next few minutes. We'll be answering your questions, responding, responding to your emails and your phone calls just to bring further clarity on the things we teach all the time. It's, so, it's such a joy to serve you the grace of God. Banking details are on the screen for TV audience, social media audience, the banking details are there. And radio audience, Mr. Michael Bush will read the banking details in the next few minutes. Always an honor and a joy to serve you the grace of God. Lift your offerings to heaven as we pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of giving. We give in faith, we give with joy. And we thank you for the opportunity to honor what Christ has done. Everyone giving around the world, I ask that their offerings tonight are a sweet smell before you. And I thank you for the privilege of giving and the privilege of making a difference in the gospel through our finances. Thank you for souls that are reached. Thank you for lives that are affected and impacted globally. And we pray that tonight everyone giving, your needs are met supernaturally according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father, for grace. Thank you for favors and thank you for ideas, concepts, and insights upon everyone giving to this ministry. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Glory to God. Make sure you give also in the house churches and campuses. Make sure you also give wherever you are, you know, as a Bible study center. All of these resources helps us to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. Tomorrow, I'm back here at 6 p.m. GMT plus one as we continue our study on understanding the understanding the scriptural truths on tithe and tithing we love you guys 
I will see you in the other studio in the next few minutes. And until I catch up with you again in the other studio, enjoy the grace of Christ. Let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service tonight. Uh, glory! Amen! Amen. We trust Woo! that glory you are blessed by this message. For these, all the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damina. Please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com do we begin on this edition of the segment of the program the segment of course is ask the counselor and the program is riot live on this uh, edition of the segment we begin as we always do with information that especially the radio audience are waiting for the account name is power city international there are three banks fcmb there is zenith and there is uba i'll start with zenith 10, 12, 36, 59, 12, 10, 12, 36, 59, 12. That's for Zenith, Power City International. The second is UBA, 139, 26, 465, 139, 26, 465. Power City International is the name. The third, FCMB, same account name, Power City International, 29, 82, 68, 2028. 29, 82, 68, 2028. To sponsor the program, to support our efforts here, you just need to call up plus 234-803-275-6104. You email Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Dr. There, of course, is DR. My name is Michael Bush. Put your hands together for yourselves. Thank you for joining us. The man of the moment is here. The... the uh, is it right to say the set man? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, the set, set man. man. You know, you know, Global Baba with you. I'm not sure again <laughs> of all the things I've been you're, on you're learning. Doing excellently and, well. You know, but you know, Global Baba, I'm on learning, I'm on learning, and then learning, and then relearning. Uh, only God will help me, Global Baba. <laughs> <laughs> I already helped. <laughs> yes. So that's Dr. Abel Damina. He's Global Baba. He's a fantastic teacher, international televangelist, and. Um, Great radio broadcaster is on radio, live radio, 11 hours every day. My, you know, Global Baba, until I met you, I thought I was the person who had the longest um, airtime on radio. And, and, that, and that's the intercontinental, Mr. Bush. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Global Baba, we spent so good to the see night. You here today, man. Absolutely, Global good Baba. So nice to be here Praise with you. God. We spent the night in Canada, so we start from the Ottawa. Right. Here we are. Blessings and great grace, Global Baba and Mr. Bush. Sir... Thank you for the one week praying in the spirit. I've been able to continue praying every morning for an hour. Global Baba, thank you, thank you. I'm growing. Global Baba, my question is in the book of Mark 7, 24 to 30, and then 7, 28. She replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. In both Matthew and Mark, Global Baba, Jesus mentioned the bride and bridegroom. Is Jesus the bridegroom and we believers the bride or vice versa? May you continue to be protected from wicked and unreasonable men. More revelation to you, Global Baba. May the eyes of your understanding continue to enlighten Mr. Bush. Rosalind in Ottawa, Canada. Rosalind, um, yeah, the parables. Remember again, in a parable there are facts, there are fictions, and there's just a lesson. The lesson of the bride and the bridegroom simply is that Jesus was saying, I'm among you people, and many of you don't know I am here. And even those of you that have been waiting for the Messiah don't even know that I'm here. But a few of you that know that I am here are the bridegroom. Okay. So, it was just a parable. All right. So, we move to Ghana. Hello, Global Baba, sir. I thank God for your life, daddy. My name is Samuel. I write from Ghana. Global Baba, I want you to pray for me for a job opportunity I've been expecting from a helper who promised to help me since March of 2020. Thank you, sir. Father, we received that job for your son and we declare it done. 
In Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Still from Ghana, Global Baba, God bless you for your labor in the body of Christ. I'm Gideon. I write from Ghana. I have some questions to ask for clarification, please, my father. One, are all angels on earth or heaven? Well, again, the word heaven, you must remember, is immaterial. Material. So even we ourselves, we are in heaven. Where we are, angels are, because the angels are there for us. Number two, which war broke out in heaven between Satan and his angels and Michael? Well, that was a figure of speech or a metaphor because the book of Revelation is written in a metaphoric language. It simply means that there was war in Eden, the Garden of Eden. There was war, and the war was for who was going to take charge. And that is where the temptation, the fall of Adam, which gave rise to Satan, who became the god of this world, the god of these aeons, the god of this mindset that opposes the gospel. So that's what he was talking about. And finally, still from Gideon in Ghana, is who are the two witnesses to be sent in the last days? We just hold it there. Global Barbas will take our first caller. Hello. I'm, I'm on the line. Yes, welcome to the program. My name is Blessing, calling from River State. I want to ask a question, sir. Uh, good evening, Global Barbas. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Bless you. My question is. My people perish for lack of knowledge. I want to know the knowledge they perish about. Then number two, I want to ask about Titan. Is, what is Titan? And is someone supposed to fight with the whole salary or with the basic salary? Thank you, sir. Okay. Bless uh, Sister Blessing, thank you for reaching out to us. The first question, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. The knowledge of God. The knowledge of Christ. When you don't have the knowledge of Christ, you become a victim in the hands of Satan, in the hands of wrong teachers, in the hands of false pastors and false prophets. You become a victim. They use you, abuse you, and dump you. So that's what it means. That's why the prayer is that the eyes of your understanding be, be enlightened, that you may come to a place of accurate knowledge of Christ. The knowledge of Christ is ultimate satisfaction. Second question. Well, I know why you're asking about tithe. It means you have not been following our teachings for a long time. You're still new to what we teach. Tithing is not New Testament. No Christian is commanded to tithe. No child of God is commanded to tithe. The tithe actually means the tenth. Ten percent. That's tithe. Tenth. That's what it means. The first person who, who gave tithe was Abraham. Abraham gave tithe. He didn't pay because you don't owe God anything. You don't owe him anything. When you give, you give out of gratitude. You give out of appreciation. You give in acknowledgement of what God has done. So there's no tithing in the New Testament. I think if you're going to a church where they're emphasizing tithing, then you need to slow down and study well with us so you can be helped to do what you do rightly. It's important. You know, I'm a pastor. If tithing was right, I would not teach against it. I would be preaching it because... There is no pastor that doesn't want to have money. But as much as I want to have money for this work, I don't want to have it in a wrong way. I want to have it properly as it is in the word of God. So there's no tithe in the New Testament. From the book of Acts, you won't see anybody paying tithe. Jesus never gave tithe. Jesus never collected tithe. Paul, Peter, James, John, none of them paid tithe. None of them received tithe because the New Testament church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So what Jesus and the apostles never did, we are not supposed to do it. However, in the book of Acts, you will see that people give generously. People even sold their houses and gave everything. Because that is the level to which they came to a place of appreciation and understanding of what Christ has done for them. So believers today are admonished and taught in the New Testament to give your best, to give sacrificially, to give with understanding, of what God has done for you, realizing that through your giving, this gospel continues to go to the ends of the earth. If you don't tithe, there's no cause, there's nothing. If you don't tithe, it's just like a man who didn't give. That's all. There's nothing like tithing in the New Testament. However, if you go on YouTube and you check my teachings on YouTube, you will find more detailed teachings on the subject of tithing. Bless you. Okay, so, so Global Baba, um, if you don't tithe, Things will not be tight with you. No, if you don't tight, nothing will be tight. Okay. Nothing whatsoever. What about all the people that are multi-billionaires? 
And yet they don't even know your God. They don't care about your God. They insult him and things are okay. Then is he you a child of God who is born of God that now God will be saying, if you don't give, it, it will be tight for you, all of that. It makes God petty. It makes our God like a God for sale. Listen, my God is not for sale. You can't buy him. When you give, you're only giving out of gratitude and appreciation as a responsible child of God who have understood that the work of God requires money to progress on the earth. And that was a good one, Mr. Bush. Fantastic. 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 Global Bad is another caller, so we'll just quickly take that. Hello. Hello. Many thanks for joining us. Hello. Your name, where are you calling from? Yes. I am Mr. Benjamin Semena. I'm calling from Lagos. All right. Go ahead. But there's a question I want to ask. Uh, the book of John chapter 1, verse 29. I am uh, Evangelist Semena Benjamin from Lagos. So my question is the book of John chapter 1, verse 29. The Bible said that John went at Jesus and he said, This is the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the whole world. And at that time, Jesus had not died, neither had he related. So I want to know exactly where he took away the sins of the whole world because they said that too. This is a past tense. Thank you, sir. All right, Mr. Benjamin, remember John the Baptist is a prophet, the last prophet of the Old Testament. So when he spoke, he spoke in the spirit of prophecy. Because in the spirit, in prophecy, it had already happened. But physically, it was going to happen. So he was speaking in the spirit of prophecy as a prophet of the Old Testament. And of course, the greatest of all of them. Okay, so let's just get back to Ghana, where Gideon has been hanging on. And he says, who are the two witnesses to be sent in the last days? Well, Gideon, the two witnesses is metaphorical. But if you want full exegesis, order for my book, The Last Days. I have a teaching on The Last Days. It's a book on eschatology. It will clarify all of that for you with sound exegesis. From Ghana to Zambia. Hello, Global Baba. My name is Kumo Yomola. I arrived from the western province of Zambia. I gave my life to Christ, Global Baba, some five years ago, and your teachings help me grow in the knowledge of Christ. The message you teach gives life. Last year, I almost didn't go to church all through because I couldn't find a church which is Christ-centered. For this reason, I would like to start something and I don't know where to start. Thank you for your time and consideration. Regards, Kumoyo Mola. Wow, wow, wow. Well, this is what we'll do. Our office will reach out to you and tell you where we have campuses all over Zambia. And you can identify with Christians who are part of Power City here and who are always learning from me and growing in the knowledge of Christ. And you will find a body of believers there that you can physically assemble with identify with and grow together with in the knowledge of Christ. Bless you. Amen. From uh, Zambia, Global Baba, we're heading to Cameroon and we're going to a place called Bamenda. Bamenda is the capital of Northwest Province. Northwest Province is like the states, yeah. you know. Greetings, Global Baba and the Intercontinental Mr. Bush. This is Evangelist Vicky from Bamenda, Cameroon. Global Baba, I'm so excited to be a daughter. I had this insight of the glorified body manifesting here on earth, but didn't know how to explain. Thank you for opening my eyes more. You are truly a father. Praise God. Amen. Praise Next God. caller. Hello. Hello, global Baba, global <laughs> Mike. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. You people are doing great work on the earth. We're growing daily by the gospel you're preaching. And I want to say a very special thank you to Global Mama also. That's Absolutely. right. He's <laughs> always there for Papa. Very true. Good, good work he's doing. Absolutely. Thank you. You are doing very well. Thank, thank you me. very, very much. The earth will never remain the same because of your gospel. Amen. Amen. Yes, I'm calling from South Africa. I'm Pastor Paul. Okay. And because of your teaching, I've been separated from my church. And there's a place we are gathering. So I want to throw this information Okay. To say if uh, if you have other people around you missing, you can just make a call. They can join us from this place. I will watch your message 24 hours for the day. Okay. And we are glad to have you. Thank you very much. Praise God. Pastor Paul, bless you. If you also send me an email with the details of all that you do, I will be glad to have that. So it will help me know where you people are and all the info concerning your gathering in South Africa. Okay. No bother. Yes. So people are gathering. You don't even know that they are gathering. I'm telling you. Yeah. It's happening. Global Baba. The intercontinental. That's influence. Yep, That's it's influence. happening. It's happening. 
As a matter of fact, that is, uh, I don't want to start a war. I'll just say, you know, something here and the whole place will go aflame. You I know. know. But that is influence. Well, thank Real you. influence. Thank you. Global influence. Yeah. We'll grow. We'll get there to grow. We're growing. Okay. We're growing. So from Cameroon, we get back to Nigeria to cross river state, Calabar. As a matter of fact, from Cameroon, we're trekking. We just get to, that, that reminds me, people say trek on foot. Yes. Were they supposed to trek on their head? No, they are supposed to trek on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay, so hello, Global Baba. May God continue to bless you and increase you, his knowledge in you as you keep revealing the truth of the scriptures. I mean, don't in Calabar across the state. Thank you. Thank you. Ben. Hello, Global Baba. I'm Luke Okojem. Please pray for me. I'm having health challenges. Thank you. Father, we rebuke every infirmity in the body of your son, Luke, and we command your body be healed. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Global Baba, let's move from Cross River State. We're heading to Anambra in the southeastern region of the country. Hello, Global Baba. My name is Keneri Chuku Nwangu. I'm writing from Onisha, Anambra State. So, I started listening to your message since 2016 in my pastor's house on KLN TV. After a while, Global Baba, my pastor told me that your preaching is not accurate that you preach like you wrote the Bible. Because he was my pastor, I listened to him, global Baba. But after a while, I made a friend who had been listening to you, and we discussed the word of God. It seems as if he's wrong, and I'm right, and to him, I'm wrong, he's right. After some weeks, he sent me your messages, three different kinds. I listened to them very carefully again and again. I listened to your message where you taught tithing. After listening, my understanding opened, Global Baba, and I started downloading your messages, and I came to a place of revelation, whereby I now understood everything you teach in the light of Christ, and since then, my Christian life has not been the same. Global Baba, I begin to see who I am in Christ, what I have in Christ, and what Christ can do through me. When my pastor noticed I'd been listening to you, he stopped giving me the chance to preach in our church. He now sees me as a disobedient person. I decided to speak to him concerning what I hear you preach. Although I didn't mention your name, he understood that what I was saying was the byproduct of listening to your teachings. That so, means he himself is listening. Absolutely. So, so, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Baba. He's hiding you know, That is savage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so some days ago, I decided to meet him again. I told him, that the message I hear him preach is not right, that is supposed to reveal to us what Christ has done for us, who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, and what Christ can do through us. But he totally misunderstood what I said. He asked me, do you mean that I should be preaching about how Christ died and after Sunday Christ rose? He asked me, am I a Bible teacher? Have I gone to Bible school? Am I an authority to say that what a pastor preaches is not right? Then I kept silent. But inside me, Global Baba, I knew I was saying the truth. What I hear you preach is the truth, Global Baba. Along the line, there seems to be an argument between us. Then I decided to end the discussion. Finally, Global Baba, I'm called into ministry. I want you to train me, and I want you to carry me under your covering. Sir, I am no longer satisfied with their messages. I want to change church. So he leaves two numbers. and um, All right. Do we have power city in Anambra State? In uh, uh, where is in it in Anambra? In Onisha. In Onisha. I'm not too sure, but our global coordinator will reach out to you. I will make sure this mail gets to him. He will give you a call. Pastor Matthew will reach out to you, and they will work out things with you. Bless you. No, but that's all. Yes. What about all that long story about his pastor? Yeah, was well, just telling us what has happened that has okay. brought him to making the decision to leave the church. So you don't bother about his pastor? No, this, the pastor he is hearing. He is hiding to listen. Okay, so eventually, the Codemos will come out in public. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so from, from Anambra State, we're heading to Nasarawa. That's in the central region, the central part of the north central part of the country. Hello, Global Baba. My name is Angel Bakins. I write from Nasarawa State. I love your teachings because anytime I listen, there's always a witness in my heart that this is the right interpretation. It's unique in this entire country. I watched the other part of your teaching you did in 2017, Live in the Spirit, and it was as if you were talking directly to me. I have the calling of God on my life. I've been told by several men of God, but I really don't know how to go about it because with your teaching, I don't even know which church around here to attend. 
Because whenever I attend, their messages don't connect at all. It's not Christ-centered. But rather, if it is not about me, then it's about material things. All the church is global, blah, blah. I know so far in my state, preach what I really don't see as a gospel, but another gospel. I need your direction on how to go about doing this work. I first stiff opposition from people, and the worst is from my wife. Things they are used to hell, fire, and holy and thou kinds of preachings. Anytime I share the gospel with her, before the devotion is over, in the middle of the sermon, she will raise her voice and say, Error, liar, etc. Well, I'm praying for her to come to the knowledge of Christ so that her eyes of understanding would be enlightened. As I said, sir, I need direction on how to go about doing God's work. Thank you so much for imparting my life tremendously. You are blessed forever. My number is blah, blah, blah. All right, well, two things. Number one, how are you praying for your wife? Because that's important. And this will help a lot of you whose wives or husbands have not come to this truth or your family members have not come to this truth. When you pray for them, how do you pray? There's no scripture that says we should pray for sinners. The scripture also only said pray for laborers. So what kind of prayer should you pray for your wife? Pray that God will release laborers in her direction to harvest her. Pray that God will send laborers to her. When you pray that kind of prayer, it gets answers without delay. So that's the first thing. You've got to pray the right prayer for your wife and be a bit more patient. Then as per training, our office will reach out to you. We have a Bible school. We have a mentoring academy. You can join any of them. And of course, you can also come for our on-site Bible school, which comes up every July. We can plan to be here July this year so that we can equip you, you know, strengthen you, help you gain a lot of stability before you embark on the journey of ministry. Bless you again. Okay, Global Baba, I now enter into the level of the program. This uh, realm of the program is anonymous all through. I have so, so many anonymous entries. I try and see if I can take um, many of them. Anonymous number one, hello, Global Baba and Mr. Michael Bush. Please, sir, help explain First Corinthians 11, 12 to 13. I need clarity. Thank you very much. First, First Corinthians, Corinthians 11, 11 12, 2, 2 to 13. Ah, that's a long, a long one. And now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Next verse. But I will have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of woman is a man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head, 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 head. You must always pay attention to what you read. Don't just read your religion into the Bible. He says the head of Christ is God. The head, the head, not hair, head, head of the man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. So every woman praying, having her husband exposed, disgraced, insulted, embarrassed, is a shame to her. What is simply establishing is submission to the leadership of a husband in the home at the church in Corinth. That a woman is not supposed to expose and disgrace her husband and then come to church and be praying like a saint. A woman has a responsibility to cover her head, which is the husband. And the husband has a responsibility not to cover his head, which is Christ. He should open Christ. Let people see Christ in his life. Let people see Christ by the way he preaches and teaches. That's what Paul was discussing. They are not scarf, not head tie, not beret. He was discussing leadership and submission in the home. Okay. Oh. Blue Baba. The Intercontinental. You know, the pastor that said, you talk as if you wrote the Bible, is right. <laughs> <laughs> I am with him. Because, I mean, Blue Baba, how is it that? Ah, no. Okay. Anonymous number two, Global Baba. I'm here. God, God bless you, <laughs> Dr. Abel Damina, for the marvelous revelation you have given me through your teachings on Christ. I'm persuaded that I'm now born again, but I have a few questions to ask you about the nature of God. In one of your teachings, knowing God beyond superstition, you mentioned that God does not kill, which I believe. But what about Luke 19:27? The indignant 
king ended by saying, but as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. Yeah, it is a parable Jesus was giving about people who rejected him. So if you reject the gospel, the, the lesson in that parable is that if you reject Christ, you will be sent to eternal damnation. That is what that parable there was saying. It's don't take it literal. Just get the lesson out of the parable. Anonymous number three, greetings, Global Barber and Intercontinental Mr. Bush. I've been following your teachings of recent on Facebook. Please, sir, can you graciously give me a concise interpretation and application of first fruit of one's earning? Now, there's no first fruit of one's earning in the Bible. So if anybody's teaching you that he's just trying to eat your money, that's all. Using religion to eat your money, that's all. There's nothing like first fruit as money. First fruit in the Bible is a language of communicating that Christ is our first fruit. So Christ is the first fruit of all those, all those who died. That is when Jesus rose, he rose with a bunch. That resurrection was first fruit. And if so, the, the people that get born again, like in a church, if somebody gets born again, he's part of the first fruit in that church. So first fruit has nothing to do with money. money. It is a mode of communicating the resurrection of Christ, how that Christ is the first to be risen from the dead, along with those who slept in Christ in the Old Testament. So don't give anybody your money in the name of first fruit. However, if you believe in a ministry and you are blessed by that ministry, of course, you bless them, support you them. give to support, but not as a first, first fruit, fruit, but as a responsible child of God. Fantastic. <laughs> Anonymous number four. Hello, Global Baba. I don't know if I misunderstood. You were teaching on parables. Did you say Jesus taught in parables to simplify the word for those whose eyes of understanding were not enlightened to understand the mystery of the kingdom of God? I got confused. Yes, that's what we said. Okay. He said, I got confused reading Mark 4, 11 to 12. To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, all things come in parables. So that blah, blah, blah. He continues. I was confused hearing these verses. Did Jesus really want to enhance the understanding of those people, or he just wanted to give them a shadow and not the real thing, which is a revelation of a mystery in the parable? Again, if we look at verse 34, we'll see that Jesus will still go to a separate place with the disciples after teaching the multitudes and explain everything to them, meaning the disciples did not understand the parables. How then could those outside benefit from the parables if the same people Jesus quoted in verse 1 that it is given unto them to know the mystery, yet they still needed explanations of the parables after the service. Go, Baba. Our last caller is on the line. We'll just take him or her. When we come back, we'll round off with this one. Hello. Okay. This, hello, this is the caller from the Netherlands. Netherlands, what's your name? Yes, this is the caller. I'm the pastor from the Netherlands. I'm calling to, to say thank you to Dr. To Dr. Domino. Yes. Yep. We thank Dr. Domino for what he's doing, the teaching that he's giving to us. We are really blessed. I'm calling from the Netherlands. I'm a pastor. Okay. Thank you. What's your name? Yes. I just want to say thank you to Dr. Domino. Okay, thank you. Thank I you. I want to support you. Yes, go ahead. The ministry, the instruction they did to me was not right enough yet. Because I'm very really blessed with the teaching of Pastor Domino. I just want to Thank you. That God will continue to increase. Please, you can send me the right information to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get that. Well, okay. Our, uh, our guys will take note of absolutely. your number after the broadcast. They will call you and give you banking details where you can support us. But thank you for calling. Okay. So, Global Baba, this long one, this anonymous number four. Um, Parables. Yes. All right. Now, listen carefully. Both the disciples of Jesus and all the people that were there, all of them were at the same level because none of them was born again. Even though the disciples had believed in Jesus, but they were not regenerated. So the things that Jesus spoke, it's not deliberate that Jesus was trying to stop them from understanding. It's that they lack the capacity to understand revelation. So since they cannot understand revelation, there's no need for Jesus to speak revelation. So he broke it down in parables. And even with the parables, they couldn't understand. However, because the disciples of Jesus had believed in Jesus and they followed him, so after he speaks parables, he takes them aside to try to explain the parables to them to the best of their, of their ability with which they can understand. All of that up until he died. It was all parables, parables, parables. 
The first proper teaching that Jesus gave, which was revelation knowledge, was when he rose from the dead in Luke chapter 24. And if you look at that teaching, it's different from all the parables in the four Gospels. So that's the explanation for that. Okay, Global Boba, in two, three minutes, we should be saying uh, bye-byes. I have um, anonymous number five. I have so many anonymous. It's, we'll, we'll try and push them to other editions of the program. But I'll just take anonymous number five and then anonymous number six. I'll take them in quick succession. Hello, Global Boba and Mr. Michael Bush. Firstly, I want to say thank you so much for allowing God to use you, transform lives. You are indeed blessed, and we praise Jesus for your life. I'm graced by your teachings, Global Baba, and I see growth in my spiritual walk. Thank you so much, sir. Please, Global Baba, I want you to agree with me in prayer for a befitting job as I continue to apply. Bless you, sir. Thank you. And then this one, hello, um, Global Baba and Mr. Michael Bush. Please pray for my brother, Owudinye Peter, in Okanafu, Nakwaibum State. My family are in tears, expecting a miracle for him. Thank you very much. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for this family expecting a miracle. Receive that miracle. Receive that miracle in Amen. the name of Jesus. Amen. And we pray for the other person who reached out to us. We declare that jobs are released to you. We open your eyes to see opportunities. Receive favor in the name of Jesus. Amen. We also pray for people who are believing God for, for fruit of the womb, people believing God for marital favors. In the name of Jesus, we declare miracles released in your direction. Amen. We take authority over sickness and disease. Satan, get your hands off. In the name of Jesus, Amen. sick bodies be healed. Amen. Father, we thank you for answered prayer. and We declare needs met supernaturally. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Global World, got to go. Tomorrow is another day. We'll be here back in style. But right now, we just want to thank all of you for being here with us and for listening or watching us from all over the world. So, Global Baba, um, tonight, continue yeah, Tonight, on we're on 9 to 10 on uh, Inspiration, Inspiration FM. FM, 10 to 12, Heritage, tomorrow morning, 5.45 a.m., uh, XL FM. FM. And then we're live here at 11 a.m. I'll also be live at uh, 8 a.m. in the morning, first service. Then we'll be live at 11 a.m. where Michael, conf- yeah, yes, the on- Intercontinental and myself yes. will be answering your questions on Comfort, Comfort. FM. Yes. And at that same time, we'll also be live on Radio Aquaibom, 11, 11 to 1. To 1. Then 1 to 3, we're on XLFM. 3 to 5, we're on Union UFM. And then tomorrow, 9 to 10, we are on Inspiration. 10 to 12, we're on Heritage again. We love you guys. And everybody else, we appreciate the opportunity to give us to serve you the grace of God. From Michael Bush and the production team, goodbye. See you tomorrow. Amen.